Stanford University. Good evening, everyone. Welcome. Uh, welcome to the first of two lectures on the topic of the Deepwater Horizon disaster and the future of drilling in the Gulf of Mexico. I'm Pamela Matson, Dean of the School of Earth Sciences, and I'm very pleased to see you all here tonight. You all know what happened on April 20th of this year. An explosion on the Deepwater Horizon drilling rig in the Gulf of Mexico killed five uh, workers and injured 17 others. And the subsequent fire burned for about 36 hours, uh, sinking the rig on April 22nd. It's estimated that 4.9 million barrels, or 185 million gallons, of crude oil spilled into the Gulf. The, well cap, the wellhead was capped on July 15th, and on September 19th, finally, the federal government declared the well effectively dead. The national and international conversation about this, however, um, is hardly effectively dead. It literally dominated the news for weeks, if not months, and um, it still continues. That conversation still continues. Much of it concerns three different questions. How did it happen, and what are the long-term consequences of the spill? Why are we drilling there at all? And what can we do to ensure that this kind of accident never happens again? And these questions are all questions that we will we'll, we'll be covering in the two lectures of this series. The ideas for these lectures came from several different individuals, uh, sort of independently, but at the same time. And it made us realize that we actually can contribute to the conversation. We can add something meaningful. And I think this should be a really interesting couple of days. There is a change. In tonight's program, however, um, our plan for tonight was to hear from two School of Earth Sciences faculty members, Mark Zoback and Roland Horn, both of whom were instrumental in the planning for this series. But Mark heard, Mark Zoback heard late last week that he would instead be needed and be spending today in Washington, D.C. And by now, he should have already briefed the Department of Energy and the Department of Interior and the Office of Science and Technology Policy on the interim report of the National Academy of uh, Sciences Committee, of which he is a member. And that committee was charged with analyzing the causes of the Deepwater Horizon explosion, fire, and spill in order to identify measures to prevent similar accidents in the future. So that, that committee has uh, some in insights that are now being reported. And if you're interested, by the way, you can look on the National Academy's website tomorrow uh, when the report or the interim report is, is released. At any rate, Mark is not here tonight, but he will be back here in a couple of weeks when we have the second in this series. I'm very delighted that Professor Roland Horn is here tonight, and I'm very much looking forward to his talk. Roland is the Thomas Davies Barrow Professor in the Department of Energy Resources Engineering in the School of Earth Sciences. He's an expert in well test interpretation, production, optimization, and analysis of geothermal reservoirs. And he is a senior fellow of both the Precourt Institute of Energy and the Woods Institute for the Environment. A member of the National Academy of Engineering, Roland has received the John Franklin Carl Award and the Lester Urin Award from the Society of Petroleum Engineers. And he is their uh, distinguished lecturer. Roland served as the chair of our Department of Petroleum Engineering from 1995 to 2006, and then was instrumental in transitioning that department into the Department of Energy Resources Engineering in 2006. So he's going to be uh, taking the podium in just a moment, and he'll give us his insights on what happened and why in the Gulf. But two weeks from now, on November 3rd, you will then hear from Mark Zoback uh, on, the, on oil and gas production and why we're in the Gulf, how it fits in the larger resource issues. Um, and you'll hear from Meg Caldwell, uh, who is the co-director of the Center for Ocean Solutions and a faculty member in the law school and a senior fellow at the Woods Institute. And she'll be talking about the impacts of the spill and regulatory reform. Uh, and then at the end of that session on the 30th, two weeks from today, all three of these speakers, Roland, uh, Mark Zoback, and Meg Caldwell, will uh, join in a panel discussion. So that, that session will be a little longer than tonight, but I think it'll be very interesting, and I hope you can all come to that. 
This, uh, these lectures are co-sponsored by the School of Earth Sciences, uh, the Center for Ocean Solutions, the Woods Institute for the Envir Environment, the Precourt Institute for Energy. And I think that, that really indicates the multiple players at Stanford from many different disciplines, many different perspectives who have something to contribute to these really complicated, complicated issues. Okay, well, for tonight, it is my pleasure to introduce Professor Roland Horn, and he's going to give us his uh, insights into what happened and why. Roland. Thank you, Pam, and thanks uh, to all of you for coming. Uh, as you've heard, this uh, three-part uh, collection of lectures includes technical issues, people issues, and regulatory issues. Tonight, you get the technical issues. As you've heard, I'm a petroleum engineer, and if you like to think of it, that represents my bias. But anyway, you begin by knowing what my bias is. I'm going to be talking about the engineering aspects of the accident in an attempt to clarify um, what actually happened on April 20th. Why do we want to do that? The, the reasons, I'm sure, is the same for all of you. This is a catastrophe of immense proportion, and it's difficult to get your head around exactly what happened and what the consequences of it may ultimately be. And therefore, forward-looking forward people, as I'm sure we all are, would like to know exactly what this all means. It's clear that things will need to change in the development of oil and gas in the deep water Gulf of Mexico. However, those changes need to be made based upon intelligent interpretation of actual facts, not people's uh, jumping to conclusions or emotive responses. We should do this based upon a full understanding of what happens. We don't want this to ever happen again. And therefore, we first have to understand exactly what was it that happened that we need to prevent. Now, I'm certain there are going to be a great many lawsuits passing back and forth with, uh, as a consequence of the Deepwater Horizon incident. And I would be very happy not to be the target of one. And therefore, I am going to state clearly here, I was not aboard the Deepwater Horizon. I don't know anybody who was. And therefore, what you will hear from me is an interpretation not necessarily the collection of the facts. This is based upon a, on a quite considerable series of sources that you see listed here. I'll talk about them momentarily. And I have been through them all during the summer and up till today. This is my interpretation of these individual collections. There have been several investigations. Uh, the House Energy and Environment Subcommittee uh, conducted one in June. And a very significant one is taking place even till today, the, the joint uh, investigation by the United States Coast Guard and the Bureau of Ocean Energy Management that used to be the MMS. They are still in, in process now. There are literally thousands of pages of testimony that took place in that investigation up to this point, which is very revealing as to actually who did what and what they saw and what was happening where. BP has done its own investigation, which they published on September 8th. Their investigation report is available on the web, and I have read it, and you'll see quite a number of diagrams which I shamelessly stole from them in that report tonight, because they're revealing in, in showing what happened. Um, Halliburton also issued a report, uh, or at least a, a PowerPoint presentation refuting actually some of uh, what was in BP's report. I'll show you some of that as well. And then as you heard from Pam a few minutes ago, the National Academy of Engineering has an investigation which is issuing today its first interim report, and it will issue a full report next, next June. Several individual groups made presentations to that um, committee. Mark uh, Zoback is on it and I will show you some of the things that they did too. In addition to that, uh, there's quite a number of issues that were associated with the spill, particularly the well testing, the pressure transits, things like that, which I was personally asked about by the 
government committees that were, were considering the actual recovery of the situation. So some of those were personal communications. So tonight I've broken my talk into four principal parts. I'm going to take a few minutes right at the beginning to address some of the issues so that you can all understand what comes later. I'm not going to talk first of all about the spill itself, but I'm going to talk about the technology and the mechanisms by which deep water drilling takes place to emphasize some of the differences between that situation and what takes place, for example, in a land rig. I'm going to talk about some of the questionable issues that have been discussed in the press, in the TV, and also in the investigations that I mentioned previously. There is many of them. I'm going to talk about a small number. And then I'm going to talk about a still smaller number, the four principal uh, events, if you like, which ultimately caused the Gulf spill to happen. That's our section three. And finally, I'll end up with some discussion about how we might do this better. So let's talk first of all about how deep water drilling is conducted and how it differs from drilling onshore. And um, I want to draw attention to a number of things, some of which I'll go to in a bit more detail. The principal difference between onshore and offshore drilling is that when you are drilling onshore, you have control of the wellhead directly under the rig. Now, we're going to talk a lot today about the blowout preventer, BOP. The BOP sits on top of the well. If we're drilling a well on land, it's sitting at the surface of the ground. The drilling rig straddles over it, and they're in direct uh, connection from one to another. When you're drilling offshore, that's not the case. The blowout preventer is still attached to the top of the well, but it's at the bottom of the ocean. In the case of the deep water horizon, it was 5,000 feet below the rig. Between the two is a pipe known as the riser, which allows for the mud circulation down to the blowout preventer, allows for the drill pipe and the, the casing and everything to go through. The important thing to comprehend, and this is really uh, something I like to emphasize very strongly in my talk tonight, the thing that you have to understand about the riser is it provides no mechanism whatsoever of control at the surface where it is attached to the vessel. All of the control of the well takes place at the blowout preventer. And between the two is 5,000 feet, in this case, of open pipe. What that means is that if the blowout preventer or the crew who are managing the well for any reason whatsoever allow hydrocarbons to enter the riser, then they're coming to the rig. There is no way to prevent it after the hydrocarbons enter the riser. Secondly, dynamic positioning of the vessel. In such deep water, the vessel basically has to keep itself in position all of the time with some fairly exotic technology. It can be done in a couple of different ways. The deep water horizon was a dynamically positioned vessel. It had motors and propellers or whatever which were continuously operating to keep it in the same location. Also, some other kinds of vessel we have are just anchored to the sea floor, but even those have to pull in the anchors and move them around if they have currents and wind like that. Necessarily because these vessels are far away, there is the issue of crew rotation. It isn't something I'm going to talk about tonight, but you might contemplate what's involved here. The Deepwater Horizon had 126 people on board in two shifts. Every 12 hours they changed. Okay. In addition, every 21 days, every three weeks, they sent a new crew offshore and the old crew came in. So there's four separate crews, if you like to think of it that way. Bear in mind the complexity of what was being done. It, in fact, required uh, 62, well, divide 126 in half. It divided half that many people, 60-odd people, to continuously operate what was going on on the vessel. And every 12 hours, they all changed. They actually staggered slightly. So you imagine doing a complex task, and every 12 hours, a whole new set of people come in. It's far out to sea, so anything that you need, you have to send out there. It's hard to get things when you need them instantly. It's difficult to access 
the subsurface because it's far below the water, which means that anything you want to do is difficult. Involved in the process of drilling are multiple companies. I see that some of you here are old enough to remember the Apollo program. You remember NASA, you know, when you're launching the launching uh, Apollo 11 or whatever, you've got, you know, Capcom, go, navigation, go, life support, go. And you see those people on television, one's got McDonnell Douglas on the back, and one's got Boeing on his back, one's got IBM on his back. That's what drilling a deep water well is like. There's a cementing company, there's a mud company, there's a tubeless company, there's a logging company, there's a drilling company, and there's an oil company, and lots of other companies too. All of them have their own people there on the rig, they're all doing their part of the job, and they all have to coordinate collectively at the same time. And finally, it's really expensive. The Deepwater Horizon was costing about $600,000 per day. Anything that was done is going to cost a lot of money. Any delay is going to cost a lot of money. That has to affect the way people work. Let's talk about the blowout prevention, the blowout preventer separation from the rig again. Comprehend exactly the issue of the riser. The riser is a pipe which is about this big. It's 5,000 feet long. Okay, if you, from where you're sitting today, if you go down Palm Drive, the, we may be at the wellhead. The blowout preventer is just on El Camino. That's how far away it is. Imagine how much fluid is contained in that volume. Once you get fluids into that, they're coming at you. You can't prevent it. The well itself was an additional 13,000 feet. Having reached El Camino, you turn right and you go down south. You don't reach the bottom of the well until you hit San Antonio Road. Okay, that's a very large amount of uh, tubulars, fluid volumes, etc., between you and the bottom of the well. Secondly, I want to talk in a little more detail about the dynamic positioning. Uh, you'll understand here you're looking at two vessels. This is the uh, drilling rig, and it's, it's riding on the second vessel. This is how they're delivered. This is not the Deepwater Horizon. This is the Deepwater Nautilus, which is its sister ship. It's basically identical, except the Nautilus is an anchored vessel, whereas the Deepwater Horizon was a dynamically pis positioned vessel. So it has on its pontoons uh, thrusters which keep it moving backwards and forwards to stay in one position over the well. The important thing about either kind of vessel, but most importantly for the Deepwater Horizon, which was a dynamic position variable, if you lose power, you're in serious trouble because those thrusters have to have power all of the time. If you lose power on the vessel, then you lose your ability to stay on station and something bad is able to happen. In the case where you have a power failure, or in, it can also happen that the thrusters have insufficient capacity, for example, to go against a current, like a hurricane, hurricanes a lot in the Gulf of Mexico, then you've got to let go quickly. You're attached to the wellhead at the blowout preventer. This is what it looks like. We'll talk about it several times tonight. The blowout preventer has two parts. The lower part here is the blowout preventer itself. The top part is the MLRP, the lower marine riser package. This is attached to the riser. This is attached to the wellhead. If you want to let go of the wellhead, you actually separate the two at this particular junction right here. So you have a mechanism which separates the MLRP from the blowout preventer and then the ship can drift away, right? Well, not quite, because you've got to remember the drill pipe is inside. The drill pipe goes down the riser and all the way down into the well bore. The vessel cannot drift away unless you have a way to separate the drill pipe as well. How do you do that? You cut it off. And right here is a particularly important device, again, is very significant to the Deepwater Horizon accident, called the blind shear ram. And the blind shear ram is a component of the blowout preventer which, which cuts through the pipe and also at the same time blocks the top of the well. It's like a, a steel pair of steel gates, cuts the pipe and closes over the top of the well, then allows nothing further to come out of the pipe. 
Finally, the remote location of the seafloor, one mile below the water, will never be touched by a human hand. Or everything which is done on the seafloor has to be done by remotely operated vehicles, like this one here. Um, they don't have a person inside them, they're actually controlled from the surface. They play a, a part in this story too. All right, my second topic. A series of questionable issues. These are all the things that you heard about on television. And when we were preparing for this talk, this is a list which I, which I discussed with Meg and Mark, I refer to as a sequence of yellow lights. If you're driving again on El Camino and the light turns yellow, you have to make a decision. These are decisions which needed to be made in the process of drilling this well. And there was a lot of assumptions made in the press about you know, whether risks were being taken, whether safety was being compromised, all of those things. These are the kind of decisions that you take every day. If you're driving along the road, the, road, the, the traffic light turns yellow, are you going to hit the brake or are you going to hit the gas? Okay, and either one could be the wrong decision. If you're really close to the intersection, you better not to hit the brake because you, know, you might lose control of the vehicle, you might slide into somebody, whatever. Better to hit the gas. But this sequence, although many of these things discussed at great length in the press and on TV, some of these had nothing in the end not very much to do with the accident at all. But if you put them all together, what you will see is that what they represent is a group of companies that basically hit the gas a lot rather than the brake. Okay? I don't think I'm going to go through all that. I mentioned a couple of them. Um, the long string. There are different ways to complete the well. Um, the long string is one, it is the cheaper of the two alternatives, the more expensive one is the liner and tieback. Um, some companies in the deep water Gulf of Mexico always use liner and tieback. Other companies, including the companies involved here, more commonly use the long string. It takes less time, it's cheaper to do, but the difference between the two is that the long string has, has only two barriers to flow whereas a liner and tie bag has three. It's not to say that the long string is unsafe, it just has one less uh, degree of safety than the others. There's a lot of discussion about the lockdown sleeve. The, when the casing is put in place, there's a sleeve that locks it in place so it doesn't float out of the wellhead. There was a great deal of discussion and technical uh, hand wringing about whether or not the casing had actually floated out of the blowout preventer, which prevented it from working. The fact of the matter was that they were ready to install the lockdown sleeve, but they actually hadn't done it at the time of the accident. We'll talk about the cement design. That plays an important part here too. The design of the uh, cement job was intended to ensure that the well, the casing would be sealed from the formation so hydrocarbons couldn't enter. There were several reasons that that was difficult for this particular well. Uh, it was a relatively large casing in a small hole, which means effectively not very much cement. There's a question about the number of centralizers that were used, which may have affected the ability of the hole to uh, be sealed by its cement. And finally, there was no cement bond log run. A cement bond log would have been used to determine whether or not the cement was actually adequate. Negative pressure test was a mechanism that they used to decide in advance whether or not the well was safe before they continue with the operations that they were doing. It's a standard practice to perform in the industry, and yet quite remarkably, I was astonished to learn this from the testimony, there is no standard procedure published in the industry by which a negative press pressure test should be conducted or interpreted. People who do them and interpret them do it based upon their experience. People have discussed whether or not this negative test was done too soon after the cement job, that perhaps the cement hadn't yet set. There's an important issue associated with the fluids that were in the hole at the time of the negative test, which in fact probably contributed to the difficulty of its interpretation. 
whatever it was, the interpretation of the negative test by the, by the crew or the people on board uh, turned out not to be correct. Fourthly, one of the most important things in drilling a well is keeping track of fluid volumes. You have a circulating system down the drill pipe and up through the casing and the riser. If you want to be aware, which you always do, of whether or not the well is flowing hydrocarbons in, you keep careful track of how much fluid you put in and how much fluid you take out. As long as those two are the same, you know that there's no fluid actually entering from the formation. And therefore, they watch them all of the time. But in this particular case, because of the fact that the negative test suggested that the well was all sealed off, and because they were getting ready to move off the well, they were in the process of unloading the, the uh, cement tanks onto another vessel to move it off somewhere else. So that made it very confusing to keep track of the pit volumes. Net consequence was they got hydrocarbons in the well bore, and ultimately, because they hadn't understood that that was the case, those hydrocarbons entered the riser. So, as I mentioned, hydrocarbons in the riser means they're coming on board. Okay, once you have hydrocarbons entering onto the rig floor, there was a number of things that they could choose to do with them. They could have diverted them off over the side, or they, as they actually did, divert them through the separators. What that meant then was instead of going into the ocean, the hydrocarbons came onto the rig. The oil, the particular oil which is found in the formation penetrated by the deep water horizon is a very gassy oil. So as the pressure is lowered, it evolved a great deal of gas. So there was gas on the rig floor, gas entered into the engine rooms of the vessel that were providing power, the engines oversped, and in doing so, the engine, this is electrically driven, driven rig, the engines oversped, they oversped the generator, they produced a gigantic amount more electricity than the rig was designed to take. People described computer monitors exploding, light bulbs exploding all around the rig as a consequence of that. That provided a source of ignition, the gas around the rig exploded. The blowout preventer is designed to recover from any disaster such as that. The entire purpose of the blowout preventer is to shut the well so that in the case of accident, hydrocarbons are not released into the ocean or anywhere else. In the process of the blowout, the crew closed the blowout preventer. All of you who know what a blowout preventer is, who watched this on television when it happened, the first thing you ask, why didn't they close the blowout preventer? Well, they did. They closed the blowout preventer very early. However, it didn't seal the well. As I mentioned to you, in the case of loss of power, you have to make this emergency disconnection between the M LMRP and the blowout preventer. It's a so-called dead man switch. There are two ways to activate it. One is that the, the uh, crew on board can press the button, let go, get out of here now. Or it has, in the case of loss of connection, power, hydraulic and communication, electrical signals, if all of those are cut, the device automatically does an EDS, emergency disconnect, shears the pipe, and lets go of the riser. That's what it's supposed to do. It didn't. Okay, that's the automatic function. And then finally, even then, there was another line of, of uh, recovery. The blowout preventer itself could be activated by the ROV, the submersible, the little submarines. Uh, they had those ROVs in the water within 12 hours of the accident. It wasn't the Deepwater Horizons ROV, but they brought in another one, and they attempted to activate the blowout preventer to close the well. Um, that didn't work either. So, my third topic, this, the list of things I told you about, that list of yellow lights. And the fact of the matter is, actually, there's rather more than I listed. I just told you about some of the ones that were discussed a lot in the press and on TV. This is my interpretation. These are the four things which basically caused the Deepwater Horizon catastrophe. And importantly, the thing to note here is that if any one of these things had not happened, 
none of this would have happened. Okay, for, for you to see what you saw daily on television, all four of these things had to happen, and they did. First of all, the hydrocarbons had to enter the wellbore. They weren't supposed to do that. They're sealed off by the cement, and they're sealed off by the casing itself. So first of all, the cement failed, and secondly, the casing seal failed. So hydrocarbons were in the wellbore. The hydrocarbons were heading for the surface. The people on board had the mechanisms to recognize that fact. However, they did not. Because of that, they didn't activate the blowout preventer. The hydrocarbons in the wellbore entered the riser. And once again, you understand, once the hydrocarbons are in the riser, they're going to come on board. Thirdly, hydrocarbons on board don't necessarily mean an explosion and a fire. But in this case, uh, the hydrocarbon gas found an ignition source. It blew up. And importantly, in the process of blowing up, took away the source of power of the rig. Once the rig had lost power, it lost its ability for dynamic positioning, and therefore it drifted off station. And finally, the blowout preventer. None of those things ahead would have mattered if the blowout preventer had closed. The rig would have been in a very serious situation. However, had the blowout preventer fa uh, not failed, the spill that you see would not have happened. So let's go through these one by one, starting here with the cement job. And I'll, I'll, I'll talk about this diagram on the right in bigger picture in a few moments. There isn't currently agreement about why the cement job failed. The cement job was designed and, and uh, processed by Halliburton. Halliburton was a cementing company. Uh, BP was actually in control of the job, saying how it was going to be done. They, perhaps understandably, disagree on who caused the problem. I'm not intending tonight to talk about who is the blame for anything, so you can make your own decisions about that. There is, however, no question whatsoever that the cement job failed. There is no other path for the hydrocarbons into the wellbore except going through the cement that was supposed to have blocked it. So let's talk about that. Cementing is actually a lot more technical than you might think. It's not just a matter of mixing up some, pen, some cement and squirting it in the hole. It's a lot more technical than that. What you see here at the base of the casing, bear in mind that what they had done just before the accident, a couple of days before, was to run the final length of casing, the so-called long string. At the base of the, of the casing is this device, which is called the shoe track and float collar. And if you imagine that you're going to put a, a pipe into, a small pipe into a bigger pipe and cement it in place, you have to run that pipe down 18,000 feet into the ground. You can't run a sealed pipe Ultimately, the pipe has to be sealed, but you can't run it into the hole sealed. Otherwise, it would float. OK, so this device is called a float collar for that reason. It actually has an opening in it, like a ball valve. You see it right here. This green pipe, when it's run in the hole, sits in this gap right here, allows the mud in the hole to pass up through into the casing so the casing can be run in. At that point, they're going to inject the cement down through the casing it runs out through the base of the casing uh, shoe down here and back up this, the hole. You see it over here on the right. The cement comes down, goes around, and fills in the gap between the casing and the hole, sealing off the formations. Now, after the cement is in place, you don't want fluids to go back up the hole like you do when you run in the casing. Therefore, this float collar has to change its function from allowing fluid to pass up to stopping allowing fluids from passing up. It's so-called conversion. And the way that they do that is they pressure up on the upside of the casing. They blow this fill tube out of this space. And there are flap valves in here, like the ones you see on the top of a, an exhaust of a big truck. And they spring closed and prevent any fluid from flowing backwards up through the casing. Now, they had some problems with this. The float collar 
is supposed to convert at about uh, four to 700 PSI. They increase the pressure of the pipe uh, and blow it out. But they couldn't do that. They tried, they had nine separate attempts to convert the float collar and ultimately they pressured as high as 3,000 PSI. Well, that's important because down here in the formations themselves, what you can see is that we have a, a, the ability to transmit pressure from the inside of the casing out through the bottom of the shoe and against the formations. If you pressurize against formations, then you can fracture them. And if you fracture the formation, then you have the ability to lose fluids and in particular, you can lose the cement, and that therefore loses your ability to seal. Secondly, there was a very small window of pressure. I'll talk about that in a moment. This was a very delicately designed cement job. If you have a very high gradient of pressure caused by heavy cement, you can actually fracture the formation simply by the hydrostatic pressure of the, of the cement itself. So they had to use light cement. And in order to do that, they nitrified the cement. They basically foamed it with nitrogen to lower its density so it wouldn't exceed the fracture pressure of the formation. And nitrified, pressure, nitrified cement is a, it's a, it's a high-tech operation, if you like to think of it as such. It isn't very commonly applied at these kind of depths in the Gulf of Mexico. Although importantly, it has been. This wasn't the first time anybody had done this. But it's the kind of thing that you might imagine is a possible source of problem. In fact, one of the two parties insists that it was. The other ones insist that it wasn't. The well itself had lost circulation zones already during the construction, during the drilling. They had been losing fluids earlier in the process. There was the potential that the cement wouldn't go into place, could be lost into the formation. And there's finally the issue about the centralizers. And let me talk about that in a moment, and ultimately, whether or not the cement job was good, a common procedure to evaluate whether or not you have a good cement job is to run a log, a measurement, which determines whether or not it's been completed successfully. In this particular case, the logging crew to run the cement bond log was on board with their devices, and they were released and sent ashore without the cement bog log being done. They chose not to do it. Okay, let me just talk briefly about the pressure windows. I mentioned this is the reason why they used nitrified cement, which is or was kind of a delicate solution. One of the characteristics of the deep water Gulf of Mexico is that the fluid pressures in the formations are extremely high. And as we go down into the earth, they increase, it's perhaps like hydrostatic or somewhat less than that. We have two pressures. We have the pressure of the rock and we have the pressure of the fluids inside of the rock. Okay, the, it's the pressure of the fluids that are high in the Gulf of Mexico, so-called geopressure. What that means is that you have to have a sufficient pressure inside of the well bore to hold back those reservoir fluids, the hydrocarbons. But the, the rock pressure isn't very high. And that means if you push too hard on the rock, you are going to fracture it and have a problem. The window between those two pressures is extremely small in the Gulf of Mexico in general, which means the margin for error in the weight of the cement which gets injected is very small. Okay, now this is a slide which I took from the Halliburton presentation. I changed the words very slightly because they are accusing somebody else and I took the name of the person they were accusing out. We're interested here only in the technical issues. There's the issue of the centralizers. Now, in advance of running the cement job that they had designed, Halliburton determined that the process of centralizing the hole, the, the, you can see the, the image up here, if the pipe is not in the middle of the hole, cement is not a Newtonian fluid. It tends to move into the larger spaces. So therefore, if you have a, a pipe which is not centralized, the cement moves into the larger space and leaves a gap on the other side. That means the formation is not sealed. In order to prevent that from happening, the pipe has kind of little springy things on the side that hold it in the center of the hole. They're called centralizers. They had six 
on board this particular casing string, which had been designed and put in place already. Uh, and based upon the design that Halliburton did in advance, they determined that that was likely to cause lack of centralization and channeling, which is what you see up here, leaving gaps in the cement. They determined that there should be 21 centralizers to prevent channeling from occurring. And that was a design that they delivered. Uh, there were only six centralizers on board. So uh, they ordered another 15. 15 centralizers were sent, but they were not installed. Okay, the 15 centralizers remained on the deck. The string was run with only six, which Halliburton's simulation suggested in advance would cause channeling. This is what it was supposed to look like over here on the right. Okay, now that's the cement. Even with failure of the cement, the casing is supposed to be closed. Okay, so even if in the annular space around the casing you have hydrocarbon, you still have a seal that prevents it coming into the wellbore. There are two places where it's sealed. One is the casing shoe itself. And remember, the casing shoe is now filled with cement and it's 190 feet long. It's 190 feet of pipe filled with cement. At the top of the casing is the seal, casing seal, which is basically rubber rings and whatever, which sit up here just below the blowout preventer, stops the flow of fluid up the back and into the riser. Either one of them have to fail before we can get fluids actually going up the casing. A lot of discussion about this. This particular slide comes directly from BP's report, and these are the reasons why BP uh, believed that it was the casing shoe that failed and not the casing seal. Um, and I have spoken to people who have seen the casing seal actually after they finally took the blowout preventer off, and it appears, in fact, as if this explanation was the correct one. It looks very much as if, quite remarkable though it might seem, the hydrocarbons actually enter the casing through the shoe track down over here. It's actually this scenario that they put in their report. Truly astounding. In order for that to happen, the hydrocarbon had to go through 190 feet of cement. What that means is that, uh, sorry, yes, 190 feet. That 190 feet had to be um, damaged in some fashion. It had to get past the two flapper valves, which had sprung back into position after the, the uh, float collar had converted. What happened? Well, ultimately, we don't know. We have to remember the difficulty they had converting the float collar. They had to raise it up, raise it up to 3,000 PSI. Um, it seems likely that that was the source of the problem, uh, but unfortunately, we will never know because right now that float collar is cemented in the bottom 18,000 feet below the sea and nobody will ever see it. We won't actually know the answer to this question. However, it is clear that one or the other failed hydrocarbons entered the wellbore. Number two, up at the surface, they were conducting the negative tests to ensure the integrity of the casing and the cement job before they got ready to complete the rest of the well. They did it twice, and both times accepted it as a successful te uh, test. I mentioned to you previously that there isn't a standard procedure, so therefore they didn't necessarily have clear guidance as to whether it, you know, what it should be in order for it to be uh, successful. I mentioned to you that as a second level of monitoring the well, they could take account of what flowed in and what flowed out, that was made confusing by the fact that mud was being unloaded off the vessel at the time. Now, let me talk, come now and talk about this confusing mixture of fluids in the wellbore, and I'll show you a picture in a moment. And funnily enough, this is actually how I first got involved in taking interest in the Deepwater Horizon, because a woman called me, a reporter from the LA Times in late April, and said, well, is it normal for uh, companies to be injecting lost circulation material, she named these commercial trade names here, into a well. And I said, of course it is. They do that all the time. They, they do that to prevent lost circulation of the mud. 
However, I subsequently was astonished to learn that that isn't what they were doing with this lost circulation material. And although this is not by itself what caused the, uh, the accident, to me, this is, this is not necessarily the smoking gun, but anyway, there's certainly a strong smell about this. After they finished the negative test, they moved on to the next stage of the job, which was to circulate the mud out of the hole. They displaced the mud out of the hole with water so they could get ready to disconnect the riser and sail away. They can't disconnect the riser when it's full of mud, otherwise all the mud goes into the ocean. In order to separate the mud from the water, they circulate with seawater, they use a spacer, which is a kind of a, uh, a viscous material which stops the mud and the water from mixing. In this particular case, however, they happen to have on board 400 barrels of lost circulation material that they had mixed in preparation for difficulties they'd had further up in the hole. And you heard about you know, the, the well from hell or whatever they called it on the television. They'd had difficulty with this well. They had losses of circulation they tried to fix. They had 400 barrels of this stuff that one of the people in testimony referred to as like snot, the lost circulation material is gooey, sloppy stuff that's supposed to bung up holes. And they had to get rid of it. Now this material is a, is a material, a dischargeable material. It's allowed to be in, discharged to the ocean because it's water soluble. However, it couldn't by regulation be discharged to the ocean unless it had been used in the process of drilling the well. So they used it. Okay, the original design that was approved by the Mineral Man Management Service for the circulation did not approve this particular use of this material. They did call for a spacer of about 100 barrels. This is a whole lot more, and it's a whole lot heavier, gooier stuff. This didn't cause the accident. However, it made very th things very confusing for the negative test. Let me show you. Here's the mud-filled well, and they're circulating through the drill pipe. The blue here is water, and they're pushing the mud back up towards the surface. Here is the spacer, which was separating the two. They're putting the water in the, in the well to make it lighter so that it has a lower pressure than the formation. If the, if the seal is intact, it won't allow flow into that lower pressure. So they pumped the spacer up above the blowout preventer and they closed the annular valves right here in the blowout preventer so that this heavy weight of uh, column of fluid didn't sit on this, on this uh, inside of the well and it lowered the pressure. The, the annular valve, the annular ram on the blowout preventer didn't seal properly and that caused the spacer to flow back down into the well. And remember, this is a very big spacer, four times what they normally would have used. 50 barrels flowed back down into the well. And at that point, the spacer was sitting in the blowout preventer. So what happened next when they did the second negative test? They had pressures that they weren't comfortable with in the first one that they measured on the drill pipe. The specification of the negative test said they were supposed to monitor the pressure on the kill line. The kill line is a smaller pipe here on the side which comes below the blowout preventer, allows for control of pressures inside of the casing. So they monitored the pressure on the kill line and it was supposed to be static and at zero pressure. That's actually what they measured. But in fact, because they had flowed this funny snot-like spacer down through the blowout preventer, it, once it was pressured up, we don't know this, this is speculation here. It flowed up through the kill line and did something. Either the weight of this very heavy material, it's almost twice as heavy as water, uh, either the weight of it caused a hydrostatic pressure gradient or maybe it simply blocked it. It's a very viscous material. So what they saw at the surface in the second test, they had uh, 1400 PSI on the drill pipe, they had zero on the kill line. These are connected. There's no blockage anywhere between them, and therefore they should have been the same. They were not. That the, the piece of paper they had for the negative test said they should have zero pressure on the kill line and it should be static, and it was. That's why they accepted it. 
but you can recognize from here this disparity between the pressures was a very significant uncertainty that you know should have at the time, in fact was at the time, be called into question. All right, now this is kind of complicated, but I promise to you it's worth understanding. What you're looking at here is a record of the pressures and the flows from the cementing unit, which was operated by Sperry Sun. You hear this talk about in reports as the Sperry Sun record. And the, the cementing unit actually transmitted its information to shore, and therefore this was recorded in Houston. The rest of the, there were other units which measured these things, but they were basically lost on board. What you're looking at here is basically the Zapruder film of the Deepwater Horizon accident. This actually shows what happens, and we could see what was taking place actually in the last hour of the job. So after they did a negative test, they started displacing the spacer as they came towards the surface. What you see here is the injection of the water in yellow, this big yellow band, and the red one is what comes out, that was coming back out of the riser. They're not exactly the same. Measuring the flow rates is not that accurate. That's why the pit volumes are important. But they're basically consistent. They have material balance. What came in was the same as what went out. At this point, it started to get confusing because they were sending mud overboard, and that mud passed through the flow out line. So at this particular point, the difference between the in and the out became confusing, at least on the cementing unit. What you do see here is that the drill pipe pressure began to increase, and it's not supposed to have been doing that because they were lightening the column of fluid in the riser. Drill pipe pressure should have been going down. This is the first indication that the well had started to flow. This is 9 o'clock, 2100. Once the spacer reached the surface, they shut in the pumps, but you'll notice here that the flow line continued to flow out. Whether or not that's because of the trip volume or not, it's not particularly clear. At this particular point, they rigged up to discharge the spacer overboard, and therefore, after this, we have no further vision of the flow out. That's not what the driller saw. This is what the cementing unit saw because the diversion was between the two. The driller could see the flow out, but we cannot because it's not recorded here. They began, once they were sure that they, they had no um, oil-based mud in the spacer, they started discharging it overboard at this particular point. And again, you'll notice that when the wells were, were shut in, the drill pipe pressure was rising. Again, it's flowing in here. Okay, let's move to the right. So they continued the displacement with seawater. They raised the, the spacer all the way to the surface. They discharged it overboard, and at this particular point, they stopped because they reached, they, were, they got water back to the surface. Now what you see, the drill pipe pressure is increasing very rapidly. And again, that's not supposed to be happening. The well it was normally sealed. So with the pumps shut off, they had a strong increase in the drill pipe pressure. Again, a third indication of flow. Now, after this point, it's not exactly clear what happens because although there's a lot of uh, testimony from people who were making phone calls, etc., through here, after this point, we don't really know all that much. This point here is simulated by BP's investigation. We don't actually know this for sure, but this is the point where they calculated hydrocarbons entered the riser. And let me remind you for a third time, once the hydrocarbons come into the riser, they're coming on board. So let's look at the last little bit. This is 2149. This is when the explosion happened. This is just about 10 minutes. This is where they calculated the uh, hydrocarbons entered the riser. Right here, about two minutes later, mud shot out of the drill floor. Now, the only mud in the hole was below the drill pipe. Everything else had been displaced with water. There's no way for mud to be coming out of the rig floor unless it came from deep in the well. Okay, it furthermore shot up to the derrick top. There's significant amounts of fluid coming out. It was lifted by the gas that was coming out of solution. Uh, there was a phone call between the rig floor and the, the uh, offshore installation manager, that's the guy in charge, who said the well is blowing out and we're shutting it in now. 
what you see here is that the drill pipe pressure began to go up because they closed, this is speculated, they closed the annular. But it didn't go up as fast as it's supposed to. So again, the speculation is that the annular was leaking. And remember, that's what it did in the first negative test. And ultimately, what they did here is they closed a second component of the blowout preventer. There are seven rams that can close the well. So then the drill pipe pressure went up very substantially. However, by this time, there was serious stuff going on. The gas was discharging onto the well, onto the rig. They had gas alarms. The engine oversped the explosion, and, and 11 people died. So hydrocarbons coming on board, it's not necessarily you know, the end. 11 people already killed by that. It was the ignition. You know, hydrocarbons on board doesn't necessarily mean a fire. Had they diverted the hydrocarbons overboard, which would have been a spill, then they would have had a little more time. They had closed the blowout preventer. The only hydrocarbons that were coming their way were in the riser. The well itself was not flowing. Once the riser had discharged, then that would have been the end of it. But as I mentioned to you, the engine intakes drew in the gas, they oversped, and they basically exploded the electrical devices on board, causing a loss of power. This is a simulation from BP showing where the gases were. And here, this is a picture, again, this is the Nautilus, this is a picture that Mark took. These are the intakes of the, of the engines. There are six, two of them were actually running at the time drew the gas into the engines, and that's what caused them to overspeed. BP made this observation in their report, and I quoted it because I didn't want to say the words any differently. Their conclusion was, which is completely, I think, evident from the testimony, that the hydrocarbon entry into the engines caused the explosion. Um, there's safety devices to prevent that from happening. However, they were not automatic. The safety devices issued the gas alarms and it depended on somebody to actually shut them off. They had automatic governors on the motors that stopped them uh, from overspeeding, but the governors, of course, to shut off, the, shut off the fuel. They don't shut off anything else. The fuel was provided externally through the air intakes of the engine and the governors were not functional. Last is the blowout preventer. Okay, now the blowout preventer is like a crash helmet, safety belt, and airbag all at once. It's supposed to stop anything bad from happening. It can be closed in many different ways. They can close it on the rig floor with the hydra hydraulic pressure. They have the emergency disconnect system, which they press a button and it automatically disconnects, cuts off everything. They have the dead man switch, the AMF, automatic mode function which in loss of communication to the rig, automatically shuts it off, lets go the MLRP, closes the blind shear ram, sealing off the well. And if all of those fail, they have the capacity to do the same thing with the ROV. Okay, so these next two slides I took directly from BP's presentation because they show this very clearly. Remember, at the end of the Sperry Sun record, they had closed one annular and they had closed a variable ball ram. So at the end of the, what we saw last, the annular up here on the LMRP is closed and they also have one of the variable ball rams closed. These are closed around the pipe so the annulus doesn't allow flow up. Okay, now what happens was explosion and fire. The annular valve here is, or the annular ram, is actually closed by hydraulic pressure. Once they lost hydraulic pressure on the rig, then the annular slowly opened. Okay, no problem. They still had a variable bore ram, which was closed right here. So the well is sealed at this point. Now, remember that the vessel is dynamically positioned and it has lost power and it's subject to the current and the wind. It drifted off station. It's connected still here to this wellhead. 
So what happens, it was 5,000 feet up, it drifted 500 feet off station. What happened then is that the drill pipe actually is pulled up through the blowout preventer. The drill pipe has wider sections called the tool joints where they're screwed together. Pulled the tool joint through the variable bore ram, forced it open. Now the well is open to flow. Okay, and it continues then to fill the riser and go up to the rig. Okay, so this is the condition they were in when they abandoned the vessel. So after that, now they head down there with the ROVs. The ROVs attempted to do a couple of things. The first thing they wanted to do here was to cut this pin. This is a non-electronic device that simply, when they lift off the MLRP, it pulls out this pin, causes the blind shear ram to close. So they wanted to simulate that. They cut it with a grinder with the ROV. So they, they sheared that off. And then what happened, the, the blowout preventer has its own hydraulic power. There's these accumulators. It closed the blind shear ram, but it didn't seal the well. They had a number of other things that they tried to do, but they basically did not work. And the important thing to recognize in all of this, in spite of the fact that there were seven elements in the blowout preventer to close off the, the well, Six of them only worked in the annular space, or, or five actually. The blind shear ram was the only one actually that they could use in this circumstance to close off the well. It had to work. It was a single mode of failure. Um, if I back up just a second. Underneath the blind shear ram is a casing shear ram, which also has the capacity to shear off the pipe, but it doesn't seal the well. And I have not seen testimony in any circumstance where anybody has discussed trying to close the casing shear ram. And why that is, I actually don't know. So why did those things fail? Once they lost communication to the rig, the automatic mode function was supposed to operate. It was supposed to release, do an EDS, and close the well. Why did it not? It had a duplexed function. There were two separate control systems that were supposed to cause that to happen. If one of them failed, the other one was supposed to make it work. The infamous blue pod and yellow pod. You heard about them a lot. The blue pod had a flat battery. It couldn't function the devices. The yellow pod had a good battery, although one of them was not so good. But one of the solenoid valves used to close the blind shear ram was not functioning. They activated it once they got it back to the surface. It did not work. So neither of the two pods was actually capable of operating the blind shear ram. How about the ROVs? The ROVs have robot-friendly knobs on them that they can turn them you know, from inside of the vessel. They can attach to the blowout preventer and provide hydraulic pressure and activate the rams using pressure from you know, external to the blowout preventer. They didn't work because there were hydraulic leaks on the blowout preventer. And the reason this picture is green is because they pumped green hydraulic fluid into the blowout preventer, and what you see is that the green fluid completely surrounded. So basically, they had no capacity to operate the rams from the ROV. Why they did, you know, once they cut the auto shear pin, why did the blind shear ram not cut the pipe? Well, it turns out that the blind shear ram only has the capacity to cut drill pipe. It can't cut anything bigger than a drill pipe. It can't cut a casing, and it can't cut a tool joint. So when a well is normally drilled, they call it spacing the pipe. They always space the pipe so the tool joints are not through the blowout preventer. Otherwise, they wouldn't be able to close them. This was in a completely uncontrolled situation. They don't know what was actually in the blind shear ram when they tried to close it. They will find out, I guess, quite soon. What do we learn from this? How do we imagine doing things better? There's several people involved. The Bureau of Ocean Energy Management it used to be MMS. That's the government. There's the US Coast Guard, which is in charge of vessels offshore. American Petroleum Institute is, a, is an industry body, if you like. There's the flag state. 
the Deepwater Horizon was registered in the Republic of the Marshall Islands and in principle was not an American vessel at all. Republic of the Marshall Islands, it has an office in Virginia, actually uh, registers and certifies the vessel. BOEM, well, these are their suggestions. They made these suggestions to the National Academy investigation. You know, they're going to post safety alerts on their website. They do have some substantial suggestions in here. One of them is that the cementing program should be certified by a registered professional engineer. Well, you know, that's a good idea. However, importantly here, the cementing program was, in fact, seemingly adequately designed, but it wasn't actually installed the way that it was been designed. And finally, they're going to take a lot more care in examining the blowout preventers. The API, the industry group, has a lot more substantive suggestions what they're going to do. I won't go through these one by one, but some of these that you can see we've actually talked about tonight. They insist that the, the lock ring on the casing should be installed um, as soon as the casing goes in. There should be two independent barriers to flow. The negative test should be run in a specified manner. The blowout preventers should be closed when they're circulating underbalanced fluid columns. That isn't what was happening here. They can circulate without having to keep the blowout preventers open. They can circulate through the kill line and, uh, and the boost line. Last one here is an important one. Make sure that what's ever in the bore of the blind shear ram is something that's actually shearable. And again, I remind you that underneath the blind shear ram is a second ram which can shear anything that's in the pipe, whether it's a tool joint, casing, or whatever. Uh, why that was not used here is not clear at all. Um, test the blowout preventer before it's put on the ocean bottom and continue to test it when it sits on the ocean bottom. Uh, make sure that the ROV has sufficient hydraulic power to actually operate the rams. Uh, they couldn't do that when they first went up to this well of the ROVs. They had to bring in extra uh, accumulators to try to operate the rams. One of the strangest ones right here, this is a little story. The ROV that they got on site the next morning, within remarkably six or seven hours, uh, had a receptacle not represented by API 17H. It had a 17D receptacle, and therefore it wasn't compatible with the ports on the BOP. They had to bring in converters to change to 17Hs. OK, these are my suggestions based upon what we've been talking about tonight. This depended on a single device. That one blind shear ram had to work to prevent this accident from happening. Let's put another one on. OK, this stack is 50 feet high. If you stand it in the corner, it will go all the way up to the ceiling. Stick another one on and have it independently activatable. In the case of an emergency, you can always close it. Um, in Norway and in Brazil, they have a third mechanism to operate the emergency disconnect. It's a, like an audio clicker like you have on your TV. They can send a sonar signal in the water. They can do it from a vessel on the surface which causes the activation of the emergency disconnect. Big difficulty they had in the deep water horizon, they couldn't tell what the status of the blowout preventer was. They didn't know which rams were open and which ones were closed. Uh, it should surely be possible to make that visible in some sort of position indicator so that the ROVs can see it. Uh, we saw the Sperry Sun data just by chance because the cementing unit was still happened to be transmitting, but normally that was not the case, but it should be. It's like the, uh, what do you call it, the black box on an airplane. We should have this information going ashore all the time so that whatever is happening can be seen everywhere. Final point. I promised you four, but I've actually got five. I've stopped in two minutes, I promise. Why? Don't we just give this all up? Why should we take the risk of all of this? Well, the point of the matter is that the Gulf of Mexico represents 30% of the US oil production currently. 80% of it is from deep water 
wells, like the one that the Deepwater Horizon was drilling. Therefore, one quarter of all US oil production comes from deep water oil fields. If we s stop production from deep water oil, uh, remember that the US imports half of its oil, so deep water oil production is one eighth of our oil production. One eighth of you have to stop driving if we are going to abandon the deep water Gulf of Mexico. You can say, well, let's get the oil from somewhere else, get somewhere else in the world. The fact of the matter is there are lots of other places in the world which are now producing from deep water. West Africa, Brazil, and other places too. A lot of the new oil being discovered in the world is in deep water in other places. So if we have to do it, can we do it safely? In the last 10 years, there have been 8,500 wells drilled in the Gulf of Mexico, about 2,000 of them in deep water. So how many of those wells actually caused a major accident? Well, actually, there was one. And you'll notice I didn't say only one because I don't want to imply that one is just a small number. It shouldn't be one, even out of 2,000. It needs to be none out of 2,000. And what we need to learn from this accident is how to prevent this ever happening again. So with that, I'll conclude and Thank you very much. We have time for a few questions. If anyone uh, has some, there are microphones on each side of the room. I, I certainly, uh, I've learned a lot from your talk, but I was curious uh, from what I know is from 60 Minutes, where they interviewed someone who claimed that the annular had been, the, the seal, uh, the ram had been broken during a test a few weeks earlier and pieces of rubber had come up through that riser. Uh, just wondering if that, what that means in, in the context of your explanation. Yes, that's correct. I, they, there was a, a lot of testimony about that also. The, uh, it's not clear why the annular didn't properly seal the well and it happened twice, once during the negative test and secondly uh, later on that could have been due to damage to the annular earlier in the job. And the, the difference between the, the blind shear ram and the annular, the annular is like an inner tube. It's pressurized with hydraulic fluid and it seals like a donut around the hole. So it's rubber. And if you pull things through it, it can get broken. The blind shear ram is steel cuts. They're a different kind of device altogether. So stripping something through the annular actually risks uh, damaging it. And there is, in fact, testimony that that happened. There were, however, two of them. There were two annulars. Uh, why they continued to use the one that was damaged, or if they knew which one was damaged, I don't know. One of, oh, my turn. I'll go over there and then here. <laughs> okay, go ahead. Uh, when, you, when you began your talk, you discussed the fact that uh, was, there were 12 hours on and 12 hours off as if that were an unusual event. And uh, there are tens of thousands of jobs like that, uh, critical jobs. The US Navy runs that way. Uh, all kinds of power plants, refineries. You, you overlap for half an hour and you discuss the issues and you think you know what you're doing. So that was my one criticism. Yes, you're quite right. I didn't intend to imply that that was unusual in any way, but you recognize the difficulty of conducting a complex operation when you have to pass a complex task to somebody else every 12 hours. And you're right, it's done successfully in a significant number of, of situations. And in this particular case, it doesn't seem to have caused or increased the, the uh, damage of the accident at all. But it was one of the things that people talked about as being a potential source of difficulty, which I don't think it was. One of the things that you glossed over was the, uh, the logging issue. You said that the logging team was sent home. Who made that decision to send them home? <laughs> Well, I, I don't know who. There were, I mean, somebody on board who was in charge of the job had a, 
a, a, um, a, tree di a decision tree diagram. And it's given in evidence. It's an exhibit on the website I showed you. And according to the decision tree, they said if they had full returns on the cement job and if the, uh, the pressure test was successful, then a cement bond log would not be required. And based upon that decision, they sent them away. And they is BP, they is Halliburton, they is, who is they? The, the people in charge of the job. <laughs> uh, if you read the test me, you'll see who it was. I'm not going to say it here. Oh, okay. My second question is uh, this uh, ram shear. Uh, you have this, this huge amount of annular material. You have this casing and you have the, the well pipe and something shears that off. And, and all of us know if we have a hacksaw, it's really hard to get through that stuff. How, do they, how does that ram work? How do you get it to, to bust through all that and seal off? They push it really hard. It's like, <laughs> it's like a pair of scissors, basically, or tin snips, if you like. When you're cut, I mean, you can cut metal with tin snips because you have a large amount of leverage, and it actually <laughs> shears the metal. It doesn't cut it like you would paper. It actually shears it through. And a shear ram works the same way. It's like two knife edges which are at an angle. So they basically hit it here and they hit it here and they push it over. So it's crimp then. So it's sort of a crimp job. Um, sort not of. exactly. <laughs> <laughs> it, Thank it, you. it pushes the two parts apart. Yeah. Uh, so the ram didn't work this time. I was wondering what was the success rate for those? It was, uh, how was it before? Like say, how many times was success? It before? does this happen all the time. Um, the, the blind shear rams are designed specifically for this purpose and they are tested you know, in design and in you know, initial construction to do exactly this. They're tested for that function. So, in, in principle, the, the answer is no, it doesn't happen very often. Again, I, I make the comparison to seatbelt and, and uh, airbags. Uh, I believe in my car, if I run into a brick wall, that my airbag and seatbelt are going to save me, but I've never tried them, okay? And I probably won't. However, important, it's important to note that about 12 months ahead of this accident, or whenever Hurricane Ida, was it Ida, hit uh, 2009, the Deepwater Horizon actually EDSed during Hurricane Ida. They actually pushed the button, released the MLRP, and sheared the drill pipe. So they had done exactly what this thing was supposed to have done successfully about, you know, within the two years prior. Oh, there's two more here. This goes more to the overall uh, issue of uh, development out there in the Gulf or anywhere else, I guess, in the offshore. Uh, as I recall, it was said that the uh, Santa Barbara Channel spill in 1979 involved uh, hydraulic fracturing to the surface outside the well. Is that uh, something that uh, has been observed in the uh, the uh, Gulf area, and are there means uh, at hand of combating that? Yes, the, uh, the Santa Barbara spill was actually rather different. It was, it was a, sort of an equally horrible result, but the causes of it were quite different. In the case of the Santa Barbara spill, the well itself failed. So it was a casing failure after the well was in operation. Uh, in terms of fracturing of the surface formations that allow hydrocarbons to come to the surface, they, as I mentioned, the difference between the fracture gradient and the pore pressure in the Gulf is actually quite small. However, you've got to remember this is 13,000 feet below the seabed, unlike the Santa Barbara Channel, which is much, much shallower. So the kind of accident that happened in Santa Barbara is probably not very likely in the Gulf of Mexico. There are, I actually don't know, but I would say tens of thousands of operating wells in the Gulf of Mexico. Remember, it's it's one quarter of our total oil production, um, largely with safety. Hurricane Katrina 
There are 3,000 structures in the Gulf of Mexico. Hurricane Katrina wiped out 80 of them. How much oil was spilled? None. Yes. Okay. One more question. Uh, you said that you know, four very unfortunate things happened in order for this to actually make the news. And if only three had happened, it would have been costly, but probably wouldn't have made the headlines. How often are there close calls? And is anybody monitoring that? Um, I don't know the answer to the first question, but the answer to the second is that the, any time that there is an incident on a rig, it's required to be reported to the mineral management services. So for example, the Deepwater Horizon reported uh, six spills to the mineral management services in the 12 months prior to the event uh, with a total of 10 gallons of oil put into the ocean. So they're required to report anything that goes overboard at any time. And we'll get back to that issue, I think, in a couple of weeks when Meg Caldwell speaks and uh, Mark Zoback. And Roland will be back then. So join me in thanking. Thank you. For more, please visit us at stanford.edu.